if you have a Bible, you can open it to John chapter 16. John 16, and we're only going to look at one verse tonight, and we're going to talk about this subject. Here's our question in our series, Facts for the Week. Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow suffering? This is a question I think that many people ask. And as we've been doing each week, we've been asking a question like this and hearing from you guys on social media. And we've got a lot of good answers this week. Some of them were to help us learn and grow. Um, we talked, or somebody said, gives us opportunity to trust in God. Um, somebody else said, it's just a part of life. Um, somebody else said, because of sin. And the answers go on and on. This was our most responded to question so far um, in this series. But a lot of good answers about why does God allow suffering? And so we're going to do our best to answer this question. Jesus said this in John chapter 16, the verses on the screen, John 16, 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me, everyone say in me, Amen. you may have Peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. I'm going to read that one more time because I think it's, it's powerful. Jesus says, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Say peace. peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Somebody say trouble. trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that that is a truth. You have overcome the world. Lord, you defeated the grave. Lord, you suffered and you died, but God, you rose again in victory. And Lord, we thank you that we can stand in victory because of what you accomplished for us. So God, we trust you. And as we seek to answer this question, would you give us a sensitivity and a um, maybe compassion a little bit as we process this uh, topic tonight? We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's this podcast that I listen to. It's called Heavyweight. And on one of the episodes, uh, it's uh, a, a man by the name of John Green, who's the author of a, a book called The Fault in Our Stars. Um, and he, there's also a movie about it. Has anybody ever seen that movie? Yeah. Just curious. Okay. Is it good? Okay. Um, so anyways, he's the, the author of that book, uh, among uh, other books. And uh, before he was an author, before he wrote this book, he was going to be in ministry. He was actually going to uh, be a pastor. He was accepted into seminary and was doing an internship as, as a hospital chaplain. So he was working in a hospital as an intern before he went to seminary. During this time, a three-year-old boy uh, was severely burned and rushed into the hospital. And he sort of gives in graphic detail some of his experience watching this event unfold. He said that when he walked into the room before he saw the boy, that a nurse handed him um, a, 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 a stick of gum and a mask. And the reason for the gum was because the smell of burnt skin was was intense and she wanted to prepare him for that. So he walked into the room, he saw the boy, he left, he went into a, a hospital sort of lobby room or waiting room and there was a doctor in there throwing up and walked past him and said, that boy's gonna die. After that, he went into and began to communicate with the parents of the boy who was, was as far as he knew was gonna die and began to comfort the family that was losing their son. He stayed all night with the family. After that, he left the hospital, went home, took a shower for almost two hours, and couldn't get the smell off of him. When he came back the next day, he went to the hospital, and the boy was gone. He didn't ask another question. He just handed in his letter of resignation. He quit being a chaplain right then and there after this experience. From there, not only did he quit being a chaplain, he actually... Uh, dropped out of seminary and then left the faith altogether and no longer identifies as a Christian. This moment for him was so marking that he could no longer believe in a God that could allow such suffering and difficulty. Now the podcast continues and for his whole life this guy John Green never did any effort to find out what had ever happened to this boy. Did he die? Did he make it? He had no idea and he was he knew the boy's name but he didn't want to google his name because he didn't want to find out the results. So, on the episode of this podcast they google the name to find very quickly this 
boy's Facebook page, who's no longer a boy, who's now about 24 years old. So then, as the episode continues, they actually get in contact with each other. John Green, the author of Fault in Our Stars, and this boy who he thought was dead, this event that caused him to walk away from God and denounce his faith altogether, they interact. And as they talk, you realize, you find out that this boy actually became a Christian. And the event that led him to Christ was this burn. Now, this young man, just a few years older than John Green was at the time, is now himself in seminary with the intentions to become a pastor. And you have this intersection that happens, that one moment of suffering for one caused him to leave the faith altogether, and at the same time, the same exact moment of suffering was the very thing that drove this young man to his relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is often the tension of suffering. We are confronted with suffering, things we don't understand, we can't explain, and yet we're experienced, and we have one of two options. We have the option to blame God and run from God, or we have the option to lean into God and trust in Him. Because the reality, like Jesus promised us in John 16, is that we will have trouble, and so the question then is not why does God allow suffering? Really, the questions have to be much more intentional than that. And so what I want to do is I want to give us really four better questions that we should ask when it comes to suffering. Because there is no real way to come to grips with suffering. Why does God, a God of love allow so much pain, loss, and suffering to happen to the very ones he loves? And in order to truly come to a conclusion about this, we must ask the right questions. So four questions that we're going to sort of ask and answer tonight. Number one is this, why is there suffering? So the question is not why does God allow suffering, but more generally than that, why is there suffering? Now, in order to understand suffering, we have to go back to the beginning. Now, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says this about the Genesis story, which Genesis 1 through 3, we see the creation of humans, and then we see the fall of humanity, and we see sin enter the world. Romans 5, 12 says it like this, therefore... Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all have sinned. Suffering, biblically, what we need to understand is a result of sin that was caused by Adam and Eve's decision to disobey God in the garden. Sin is the cause, and sin has affected and impacted every person. And the proof of sin, according to Romans 5.12, is death. All have sinned, and the proof of that is that all will die, and all people that have lived and died have died. So sin is the cause, and sin has affected every person. Genesis 3, 17, after Adam disobeyed God, God said this, uh, therefore, um, because you listened to your wife and ate fr the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. It says this, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Cursed is the ground. In other words, sin has impacted everything. Every person, but even the air we breathe, and the ground we walk on has been affected and impacted by sin. So we need to understand that the cause of suffering is not God. The cause of suffering is sin. The, the cause of suffer, suffering is error. That God's original intention was for no sin and no suffering. But because of error... Because cursed is the ground, the very ground we walk on, the air we breathe, the experience that we have, the life we live is broken because of sin. So we need to recognize that the reason there is suffering is because of sin. Now, the second question we need to answer is, how does God feel about suffering? This is a better question than why does God allow suffering? We need to understand God's heart. How does he feel about suffering? 
When he looks on the world and sees just as much pain and heartbreak and injustice that we see, how does God feel about it? What is he doing? Do you think he turns a cold shoulder or doesn't care or is uninterested? Or do you think God feels in some way like we feel? Genesis 3.15, God says this. This is immediately after humanity disobeyed God. God said, and I will put, he's speaking to the serpent. If you've never read Genesis 3, it's a really interesting story. You should read it. Anyways, I'm just throwing us in the middle of it. God's speaking. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking of the, the tempter, the one that drew them away. And between your offspring and hers. Listen, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In this verse, Genesis 3, we see the first foretelling or glimpse of ultimately which, that which will be the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Immediately in the beginning, humanity sins, sin enters the world, and with sin, death, but right away, God has a plan to redeem all of mankind. He says, I will produce from the offspring of a woman, from the seed of a woman, from the Virgin Mary, I will produce the Savior of the world, and he will crush the head of the tempter altogether. This verse is both revealing about how God feels about suffering and his plan to fix it. To summarize, God hates suffering. And he has a plan to destroy sin and suffering altogether. Now, this isn't just mentioned here. It's not like we read Genesis 3.15 and then we never hear God's plans for redeeming humanity or destroying suffering ever again. God's plan for ending suffering and redeeming what was lost in the garden is woven all throughout Scripture. Over 70 verses in the Old Testament alone point to a day where God will deal with suffering entirely. Look at this uh, photo. This is from uh, the, it's kind of overwhelming. I just wanted you guys to see it. On the left, and what's zoomed in uh, on the photo on the right, is all the times in the Old Testament where there's a promise given by God that he is gonna one day redeem the world. If you guys wanna look at this in more detail on the the coffee table out there, the infographic Bible is what it's called. That's where this is from. Anyways, there's over 70 promises in the Old Testament given saying of God is going to redeem or he's gonna put an end to suffering. And on the right, we see the fulfillment of it in its anticipation in the book of Revelation. One verse from that list, Isaiah 25, eight says this, God speaking, or it's speaking about God. It says, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. God, from the very beginning, has plans to redeem and restore that which was lost from the disobedience and sin. And his plan to do this was through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He defeated death by dying in the place of all mankind. This dealt with the problem, that is sin, and is made a way for salvation. And when we look around at the world and we see sickness, war, injustice, disappointment, hurt, and all types of suffering, it is easy for us to assume that God doesn't care. Because if he cared, he would do something. This is oftentimes our logic. The reality is that God does care and God has done something. He's dealt with the sin problem, which is the real problem. All of the stuff that we see are the symptoms of the real problem. You ever been sick before? You know how when you're sick, there's a problem and then there's symptoms or side effects or other problems along with the problem. Oftentimes, we get caught up with the symptoms. We get caught up with the side effects. We get caught up with not the root issue of the problem. Listen to me. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, dealt with the problem, the problem being sin. So we can't sit around and say, God's not done anything or God's not doing anything about suffering. He has. God hates sin. God hates suffering, and he's dealt with it through Jesus. 
Point number three, question number three, how then do we walk through suffering? What caused suffering? Well, suffering is a cause of sin and disobedience. How does God feel about suffering? Well, he hates it and he has plans to redeem it. And so then, how do we walk through suffering? Because suffering is a result, Jesus dealt with it, yet we will suffer. That's what Jesus said. There's two promises in the verse in John 16 that we read. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That's one promise. And then in this world you will have trouble. That's a second promise. That's not such a good promise. We like the in me, we will have peace promise. Like refrigerator promise, amen. In this world you will have trouble, not a refrigerator promise. That's one we like to be like, ah, oh, really? Why'd you have to say that? It's two promises, trouble and peace. In the world, you will have trouble. That's a promise from Jesus. But in Jesus, you will have peace. Notice the difference. In this world, you will have trouble. And in Jesus, you will have peace. We experience the first promise a lot, don't we? The first promise being in this world, we will have trouble. Like all of us were like, yep, I've experienced that promise. Thanks a lot. I've cashed that one in basically every single day. But do we experience the second, the second promise of peace? Now, the second promise of peace does not cancel out the first promise of trouble. Because if it did, I don't think Jesus would have made the first promise of trouble. If Jesus was just offering peace all the time and no trouble, he wouldn't have said, in this world you will have trouble. He would have just said, in me you will have peace. Are you with me? So the second promise of peace does not cancel out or negate the promise of trouble. They actually go together. How does this happen? Well, Jesus says that it's because he has overcome the world. The word overcome that's used there in the original language is in the perfect tense. What that means is it speaks of right now and of the future. It is a current and ongoing action. When Jesus says, I have overcome the world, it means that he has, I I have currently overcome the world and I am overcoming the world. Jesus has overcome the world in suffering and he is overcoming are suffering. The idea is that in Jesus, you can have peace in the midst of trouble and hope for the end of trouble. In Jesus, you can have peace in the midst of trouble, meaning confidence and and dependency upon God in the very midst of suffering. And you can have a hope or an expectation for the end of trouble. That Jesus both has overcome the world and is overcoming the world. So how do we walk through suffering? We walk through suffering sort of holding both of those realities in our hand. We're holding on to Jesus saying, God, you're going to give me peace in the midst of it. Biblical peace is a peace that surpasses understanding. Doesn't necessarily make sense, but we can find peace that goes beyond our circumstance, joy beyond what we're experiencing. That Jesus, we hold on to the reality of peace in the midst, and we hold on to the hope of the end of suffering. And with the promise of Jesus, the promise of the Bible, of that hope to the end of suffering, is not, it might not be experienced in our lifetime. For some, the end of suffering might not be experienced while we breathe our breath here on this planet, but there's an expectation, there's a hope that God will one day wipe away every tear and redeem and restore all the things that was lost and hurt and taken from us and returned in an even greater way. So we hold on to the peace in the midst and the hope for the end. Okay, last thought, last question is this. Is there a point to suffering? And worship team, you could come up here. Is there a point to suffering? Because the cause of suffering is disobedience, it's sin. God hates suffering and has already put a plan to not only solve the sin problem, but also restore and redeem all that was lost. God promises us peace in the midst of it and hope for the end of it. 
But what's the point of it all? Why does it happen? Why do we walk through suffering? What do we learn from it? Romans chapter five, verse one says it like this. Therefore, everyone say therefore. Therefore. Since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, ready for this? But we also glory in our sufferings. That's pretty intense. We we celebrate is the idea. We celebrate our sufferings because... We know, there's confidence, we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. The promise of the Bible is that there's no such thing as pointless suffering. The promise of the Bible is that God can work all things together for good. The promise of the Bible is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear nothing because our God is with us. The Bible promises us peace that surpasses understanding and joy in the midst of pain and hope for the end. But we also trust that that suffering isn't pointless because it's producing something in us. That God is teaching you either a character about him or he's teaching you to learn to depend on him more or to grow in some area of your life. One of the things that suffering does in our life is it causes us to care about other people more. Those of you that maybe have lost a parent, you can sympathize and empathize with people that have lost their parents. For those of you that maybe your parents have gone to, gotten divorced, you know what it's like to walk through that and you can, you can encourage and help somebody else. Those of you that maybe have had disappointment or betrayal in your life, you now empathize and sympathize with those people that walk through that. Those of you that have a diagnosis or a sickness that you're really not sure what the result is going to be, you know what it's like and you can come along a side of somebody else that's walking through something similar and walk hand in hand, not with all the answers, not with all the explanation, but to be able to stand with somebody and encourage them as they walk through that. Suffering is never pointless. Because God wants to redeem it in your life to cause you to grow and use your life to bless and help and encourage somebody else. And so often when we're asking the wrong questions about suffering and we're asking God, would you just take this suffering from me? God, would you just get me out of this? I can't deal with this anymore. We're missing the obvious that God's actually doing something in our life to make us people more like him, like Jesus, who was acquainted with suffering, even to the point of death, to then be able to come alongside other people and point them to the one who provides peace beyond our circumstance. We have hope. We have confidence that God is walking with us and walking us through it, and, and that it's producing something in our life. So rather, and going back to the original story, when we're faced with suffering, and, and maybe it's, it's extreme suffering like the story of watching a boy in your mind die and go, Why, how could God let that happen? Maybe we need to ask a different question. Maybe we need to ask, God, what do you, how do you feel about this? And God, what are you trying to do in the midst of this? Because let me tell you, God cares about every loss. God cares about every disappointment. God cares about every heartbreak. God cares about every diagnosis. God cares about every broken home. God cares about every experience that we walk through. And so rather than asking God, where are you? Or why don't you care about me? Maybe we should begin to ask the question, God, what's your heart in this? And how do you want to use me right now to bring your heart of love and compassion and purpose into this situation? 
to redeem this so that it's not pointless suffering, so it's not all lost, but we can find peace and hope and purpose in the midst of it. Because God sees and he cares and he wants to use our lives. He wants to use your life to bring more of the heart of God into the midst of that tragedy or that suffering. I want to read that first verse where we began one more time because I think it it so clearly shows the heart of God. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your heart of compassion, of love. Lord, to to do probably the most difficult thing in the human experience to do, to lay down your child's life, giving up your one and only son to suffer and die so that we could find life in you. Lord, you are acquainted with suffering. You are our suffering savior. And God, we thank you that because you have walked through it, you know exactly what we need to continue to walk through it. So Lord, give us that strength. Give us that ability to keep going. And Lord, give us the the proper heart to view what's going on in our life in a way that we can infuse your heart of love and redemption into it. And Lord, I wanna pray for every person that's here, especially those that would consider themselves in a season of suffering. Maybe it is because of uh, of something going on at home or maybe it's within their own body or maybe it's within their group of friends or maybe it's just beyond their control altogether or maybe it's just generally as they look at the world and all of the hurt and war and turmoil and conflict and, and dysfunction that's happening, they just feel so grieved. Lord, would you use their life or would you redeem them and would you be with them even now? Lord, we pray for healing. Lord, we pray for healing over every body that's sick. Lord, we pray for healing for every mind that is worried and anxious and, and, and lost and confused. Lord, we pray for healing in every broken home. Lord, we pray for restoration with every friend or loved one that's walked away from you. Lord, would you do, God, what only you can do. Lord, we want to now, like you said, to take heart, trust in you, for you have overcome the world. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you even when we don't understand what you're doing. We thank you. In Jesus' name.